recording this. All right. Um, any questions I need the previous farm stuff we've covered? Yes, ma'am. Can you just um, go over the difference again between an adverse effect and a side effect? Yeah. Um, and you may hear them used a little interchange interchangeably. Usually side effects is something that's like generally more minor, right? So again, if I had something like I was taking an ACE inhibitor and I developed a dry cough, probably not going to kill anyone. It's a side effect, right? It could be pretty bothersome. It could lead you to not want to take that medication anymore, but it's not so severe. However, if I were to have like a really like adverse reaction where I have like angioedema develop, that's potentially life threatening. Or if I develop Stevens Johnson's after taking Bactrim or something like that, those basically that's kind of where you're looking at. So an adverse reaction is generally more severe. Side effects are generally kind of minor things that are kind of to be expected just through the mechanism of the drug itself. If you have like second, I mean, was it side effects? You can have good side effects. Right, Potentially, yeah. You can actually have. I mean, if you wanted to kill your patient, maybe that's considered a good good adverse effect of the drug. Um, no, nah, not generally, right? But for instance, if I'm taking like bimatoprost for my glaucoma, and all of a sudden I have nice luscious lashes, um, that that could be a, a welcome side effect. But generally, like an adverse reaction typically is going to be negative for the most part, right? And most adverse reactions should be, or most uh, side effects should be negative as well for for the most part, right? Uh, any other questions I can answer for you? Okay, so I wanted to go over the prescription writing assignment a little bit. I'm not going to go over the ones you're doing specifically, but I just want to kind of go through the process. I uh, noticed a little apprehension from some of you, maybe all of you. I know you've never written a prescription before. That's totally okay, right? So, again, we're all here to learn. We're all at the same level. Um, you know, I've written some prescriptions, but again, I'm not the main person to write them. However, I do receive quite a few of them, and, and, and so we'll go over that and see what we're looking for, make sure we kind of cover everything, um, uh, and make sure it's legal, make sure it's everything that we need to make sure the patient gets exactly what they're supposed to get. So let's say, for instance, I have a patient who has hypertension, and I want to start him on the drug lisinopril, okay? So lisinopril, it's a good first-line medication for hypertension for some patients. It is, uh, it's an ACE inhibitor. Right, so what do you think it does as far as its, uh, what are the downstream effects of blocking the enzyme ACE? Less angiotensin 2, right? So if I have less angiotensin 2, it's going to cause less vasodilation, I have less ADH, less aldosterone. Very good for, for treatment of hypertension, as we'll see. So let's say I want to write a prescription for lisinopril for my patient. Let's say I have no idea how to dose that drug. Someone just said, you know, say imagine uh, I have my supervising uh, physician was like, hey, go ahead and get this guy at lisinopril. And I'm like, oh, I've never dosed that drug before in my life. Sometimes you may run into that. Let's see how we would go about the process. So everyone familiar with the library website? I will show you the way that I would go about doing this. Uh, you don't have to go through the same uh, mechanisms I am. However, this is one way to do it, right? So anyway, so imagine uh, I want to go to a drug reference. I like LexiComp. That's what I've been using for most of my career last couple of years here. Um, so I would go ahead and go to databases. And this is all recorded, so it'll be posted online, so you don't have to worry about um, you know, necessarily typing out every individual step. It'll be available to you. And so uh, LexiComp starts with an L, so I'm going to go to the L's here. Okay, L. And then I'm going to go down to LexiComp. Here we go, LexiComp, LexiDrugs, this is the one I want here, right? So I'm going to click on that, and I'll put in my password, or if I have it saved, I'll just hit log in. Okay, so now, and again, okay, great, they're using cookies, whatever. Uh, now I'm at the, the drug reference, right? So I want to go ahead and say I want to do lisinopril. If I had the if I only had the brand name, I could put that in as well. It'll come up with the same thing regardless. So, uh, for instance, let's say I just want to put in Zestral, C-S-T-R-A-L. That will also come up with lisinopril. Okay, so notice here there's different databases. So, for instance, if I was dosing it for a pediatric patient, um, I can go to pediatric LexiComp. If I want to do it for an adult patient, I could just go to regular LexiComp, right? Um, so, unless you're doing pediatric specifically, just stick with LexiComp. That's fine. Okay, you notice here I put in Zestral. That's a U.S. brand name for lisinopril. Okay, so that's what I want to use. Okay, so I'm going to click that. And so we said, what was my disease, disease state that I'm treating? Hypertension. It's good to remember your indication, right, you want to dose this for. So, okay, so now I have all this uh, all this information here at my disposal. So the first thing I want to do is, all right, well, how do I want to dose this medication? So let's go ahead and scroll down. you see dosing adult. Okay, so I have dosing for acute myocardial infarction. My patient hasn't had that yet, so let's not worry about that. Uh, heart failure. So you see every drug can have different indications. It's important to go to the right one for, for your patient. You may see the dosing is pretty similar depending on what you're dealing with, but uh, it could be drastically different depending on the condition. So let's say, for instance, we're doing hypertension here. Okay, orally, initial, five to 10 milligrams once daily. And then we can titrate based on patient response up to say 40 milligrams. Now I'm just starting a patient on this. It's okay to start with a starting dose, right? So let's say I want to do say five milligrams for this patient once daily. Okay. So now I have my dose. The next question is, is what do you think? Okay. How often? So again, that's good. So I'm going to do five milligram once daily. So that's how often. Question is, how does the drug actually come? Right? So if I write for something, say I write for uh, 37 and a half milligrams of lisinopril, 
that may not be like a reasonable dosage form for, for that drug. You want to make sure you're dispensing something that is actually commercially available, right? So in this case, let's go down to, we're going to go to the section, and we're going to go to dosage forms. This will become very important when you're doing liquid preparations, uh, as we'll see here in just a second. I'm going to do two examples here. Um, so, okay, I went to dosage forms, and you'll see here that this will list out all the different dosage forms that are available for this. So again, I have an adult patient. He can probably take tablets. So I'm going to go ahead and do a tablet. And so you notice the different sizes that are available here, okay? When it says scored, what do you think that means? Yeah, where it has a, a line down the middle of it where you can break it in half, potentially. Some of them have different uh, scoring, but that's basically what that means. So, okay, so I can see here's uh, here's some different brain names are available. Here's a generic, so I know that generics are available if I need to do that. Let's see, it comes in a 2.5, a 5, a 10, 20, a 30, and a 40. So, for this patient, I decided I want to do 5 milligrams once daily. Which tablet size am I going to use? Makes sense. I'd use the 5 milligram tablets, right? So, again, it's just as straightforward as that. Okay, so now that I have my dosage form that I don't want to use, I have my dose that I want to use, I have my frequency, now what's left? Let's write the script, right? Let's go ahead and go and see how that would how that would work out. So I have a blank document here. I'm just going to go ahead and just uh, work through it real quick. So let's say I got the Main Street Clinic, right? I'm going to have my provider, so Dr. Acula, and then let's say his. I'm going to write down his DEA slash NPI slash uh, license number. Get all that information, right? I'm going to include the address for the. Uh, he's a hematologist. We couldn't figure that out. <laughs> Anyway, um, you know, I'll include the, the phone number. I'm going to include the address for the, the provider because, again, that's important to include. So that way if I have a – if the pharmacist has a question, they can call up and, and get anything clarified, right? So I'm going to put all that information at the top. That Usually they'll have pre-printed prescriptions. They'll have that on there. Or if it, you're using it through, like, an electronic system, it'll print out with all that information. You don't have to worry about that necessarily, okay? So next I'm going to put my patient name. So let's say I'm going to do John Doe. What else do I need to include? Date of birth. I'm going to include that. Anything else? You can include address. I would recommend doing address, so that way I can make sure that I identify this John Doe versus all the multitude of other John Does who may share the same date of birth. I can't tell you how many times we'll have like you know three or four Smiths in the ER or uh, three or four Garcias, and they all have the very similar dates of birth. And again, so you need to have multiple patient identifiers, and so at least having two different ones is good because I can identify which patient I'm dealing with. So uh, if I have a date of birth and an address, that's pretty good linkage to that one particular John Doe in this instance. Okay, good. Uh, what else can I include? If you wanted to, you could do allergies. So I could say like, you know, no known drug allergies. That's an okay abbreviation you could use or NDA or no, no, no drug allergies. That would be totally fine to include there as well. Okay. And again, this is a little bit of an abbreviated form. If you look back at the, the rubric, that's kind of the, the gold standard what I want you guys to follow. Okay. So again, I'm just going to do this for, for speed purposes. Okay. So now I've got all the information about the patient that I need. Got date of birth, got the address, allergies. I want to include that. The name of the patient, again, very important. Um, what do I want to do now? So if we're looking at the rubric, you see now we can actually get to actually dosing the drug. Okay, so this, this is going to be the, the one part I wanted to put here. So what am I going to start off with? The name of the drug, right? So I want to say specifically what drug I'm actually going to be dosing for this patient. So I would say lisinopril. Now, do I have to put the brand name? I don't have to, right? Now, if I put the brand name, does that mean he has uh, the pharmacist has to fill the brand name? No, unless I put DAW, they will substitute the generic every time because, again, it's a cost savings for our patient. And again, most patients are going to be cost conscious uh, to some degree. Okay, so I'm going to say lisinopril. Now what? Strength. Yeah, you want the strength of the, the tablet or the do dosage form that we're going to do here. So in this case, I'm going to say 5 milligram tablets. And again, if I look back at um, LexiComp, you saw that this comes as a tablet oral, right? So that way you can figure out if it's a capsule or tablet. Um, again, you want to be specific when you're writing that because sometimes you'll have dose, uh, drugs will have some capsules, some tablets. just depends, okay? All right. So I say lisinopril 5 milligram tablets. Now I want to go ahead and put what? I want to put my instructions for use, right? So I'm going to say how I actually want them to take the medication. So how would I say that? Take so okay so there's two ways I could do this I could do take one tablet PO so I want to include my indication or my, my route I should say so I could write PO I could write orally either one would work fine take one tablet PO how often daily now do do I can I put QD no I never put QD I can put Q, Q day I can put daily we we'll put Q daily I can put Q 24 hours any of those would be totally fine, okay? They still get across the same point, okay? They're taking this drug one time a day, okay? The other thing you could do instead of saying one tablet, you could say take five milligrams PO one time daily, okay? That would also work as well. Uh, but again, because I've indicated these are five milligram tablets, by saying take one tablet, the dose is pretty well understood. Make sense? Okay, so I got that. And then what else do I need? Indication. Good, so I want an indication. I want to include that because, again, that's good practice. Is it required by law? No, but it's a very good practice. So what am I going to put here? 
Yeah, so I could put for uh, high blood pressure. Oops. Or I could put for hypertension. I could put control of blood pressure, whatever I want, right? So I can put basically trying to indicate what this is for. Because again, you saw there's other indications are on there. So if I'm using it for an acute MI, if I'm using it for a CHF, um, again, that might not be important for this case, but for other drugs, there may be wildly different indications, right? So um, this is you have to be careful. So, okay, so I have my indication of how much they're going to take, how they're going to take it, all that good stuff. Now, what do I want to include? Yeah, so I want to include the quantity to dispense in these cases here. So I have to put my quantity, and I can put how many? Yeah, so this is going to be a continuous medication. They're not going to just you know stop after 14 days, like, hey, I cured my hypertension. I'm good to go. No, this is going to be a chronic condition. So again, I can put 30 tabs. Or tubas, so maybe. All right, so 30 tabs. Good. And what else do I need? The refills. Good. So I'm going to uh, put refills here. How many do I want to give? How many is the maximum I can give for this group? One year, 12 months worth. I could write 12 on there, but can they get 12 refills? Because the prescription is for the initial fill, I would put probably 11 refills, right? So that way they can get it once a month from then on out, okay? Alternatively, I could probably, uh, depending on the patient's insurance, I could put 90 tabs as a quantity to dispense and then put how many refills? Put three refills in that case, right? So again, because this is going to be continuous medication we're going to be taking uh, for, you know, uh, you know, pretty much forever for, for most patients, as you'll see, okay? And then what else do I need? All right, so I need my signature as well. So I'm signature, done. Okay, pretty straightforward. So again, uh, I think like you have like a Salivax prescription. Do I put that on there? Again, if you have a specific like duration you're going to want to uh, prescribe before, you can put for so many days. All right, that's good to include as well. So that way you can make sure that um, you know your quantity to dispense matches how many days of therapy you're going to be giving this for. Okay, everyone with me so far? So again, not as stress inducing. Again, when you get used to this, you're gonna be right. You can pump out these all day long, right? Depending on where you're working, what kind of uh, patients you're dealing with. Okay. Some patients have 10, 12, 15 scripts. You're gonna be writing all these uh, new refills for at least once a year in some cases. And so, you know, yes, sir. You said for controlled sub substances, it was six months. A max of six months for which ones? C2. Schedule three, four, and five. Okay. Schedule two. Remember, schedule two is what? No refill. It has to be in person. It has to be hard copy. No refills on C2s. Okay. So like oxycodone, hydrocodone used to be a C3. I used to be able to do six months of refills on hydrocodone, but guess what? Not anymore. Now it's a C2 because people are abusing it. So now zero refills on those. How many days can I write up for though? Those you can do a maximum of 90 days worth for a C2. Okay. So I could do 90 days worth. Very rare that you would see that, but I could do that. Or in some cases, imagine if I have a, a patient, because again, a lot of the amphetamines that we use for ADHD, so a lot of kids have uh, these amphetamines they're on. But you know, does the mom want to come back to the doctor's office every single month to get a new script? Probably not. So what you can actually do is you can write three different scripts, and you can actually write on there, do not fill until one month from now, do not fill until two months from now, you know, on the specific dates. So that way they'll have three scripts, and they can take each one of those back to the pharmacy and have those filled uh, one at a time. So that's a one way you can kind of get around that. But generally, no more than 90 days worth uh, for a C2. How many refills can you do on a C1? None. None. Can I prescribe a C1? None. Not, not unless you're in some very odd circumstance, you're doing research or something, or, you know, that. anyone ever see the movie um, Half-Baked? Remember, like, uh, Dave Chappelle goes to, he gets a, the research project where he's working with the marijuana, and they just give him, like, a big thing of it, and he almost falls. You should watch that movie. It's very funny. Um, anyway, you're probably not going to be dealing with C1s ever. And yet, federally, marijuana is still C1, so that would be one of those cases there. Okay. Let's do one more. Um, just for example purposes, let's say we want to do, uh, we'll just do a new page. Actually, I'm just going to, uh, guys, okay if I delete this? Again, it will be on the video, so you can refer back to that. Yes, ma'am. Um, that's a good question. Usually, I mean, it's one of those things where they will, within, as long as within, you know, a couple of days to a week or so, like that is probably reasonable. If it's like three months later and they're coming in with a script for oxycodone, I would be pretty suspect of that, you know, so I don't know off the top of my head. It's probably... Yeah, they should probably be pretty much immediate fill, but for the most part. But again, it's one of those things where if it, if it makes sense clinically, so in the instance where I'm writing for three months worth of ADHD meds, and the provider, you know, the provider wrote for the first, wrote for all three scripts today, but I wrote on there, do not fill until this day later. It's okay if they come in that month later because that makes sense based on the prescribing and all of that. But if it's like for pain meds, I'm like. Okay, maybe you probably should have come in for those payments when, when you initially had the issue, when you had the script filled. So, again, it's all going to take some, some clinical judgment there. Okay. 
Okay, so let me do another one real quick. Let's say we want to treat an infection. So let's say, for instance, I want to treat, uh, what's a good one? Let's do acute otitis media. Oh, what did I give you in your uh, assignment? Did I give you moxicillin? Um, yeah. We'll do something different. Let's do, let's do Bactrim. Let's do Bactrim for, uh, so Bactrim is commonly used for a lot of like skin infections. We'll use it frequently for like UTIs. Um, it's a combination of two drugs here called sulfamethoxazole and trimethoprim. And we saw an example of that in the in the um, uh, PowerPoint. Remember, if you go back to that, we saw that you know you dose it based off one of the components there. So this is a good one. So if you look at the actual dosing here, uh, so let's imagine. Actually, let's go and do a, a Pete's prescription because that's what's on on your assignment. So in this case, I'm going to go to the pediatric slash neonatal Lexi drugs. I click on that, and basically it's all the same information, but it'll put the pediatric stuff first, essentially, so it'll give you a better idea what you're going with. Um, so again, let's uh, say we're doing pediatrics. Uh, say we're going to do like a three-year-old kid or something like that. Say he weighs 10, 10 kilos, okay, for our purposes. Um, say a two-year-old. Uh, let's say we're going to go through and look at different indications here. So, okay, you know, meningitis. Okay, kid's not that sick. We know meningitis. Uh, let's say we have acute, uh, acute otitis media. Okay, it's probably not going to be uh, a preferred drug in that case, as you'll learn, but let's just go with that, okay? So look at my dosing here. All right, so for kids and adolescents, oral 6 to 10 milligrams of TMP per kilo per day. Okay, so notice that. So we're dosing it based off the trimethoprim components. So that's already taken out. So that will always indicate. If you have a combination drug, it'll tell you what you're dosing based off of. Okay, so here's 6 to 10 milligrams per kilo of trimethoprim per day. Divided doses every 12 hours for 10 days. Okay, so I have my duration of use. I have how often I'm going to give it, and I have the actual amount I'm going to give. Okay, so said, let's say we're dealing with a 10 kilo kid. How much am I going to hit with trimethoprim? Yeah, so let's go with 100. Let's, say, let's stick with some round numbers here, right? So let's say, okay, we have a 10 milligrams of trimethoprim. So again, you have to make that decision, right? So some of it will be based off rounding of numbers and things like that. But let's say just for ease of use, we're going to say let's go ahead and give 10 milligrams. Sometimes based on severity of disease, you might choose 6 or 10, but let's go with 10. Okay, so I'm going to do 10 milligrams of trimethoprim per kilo per day. I have a 10 kilogram kid, so how much are they going to get? 100 milligrams of trimethoprim per day. How often am I giving it? Twice. Twice. So that, what does that mean? Uh, all right, so per dose, I'm going to be giving 5 milligrams per kilo per day. So I'll show you that in a second here. All right, so just kind of keep this in mind. So um, you can just so I can write that out for you guys. So again, imagine I have 10 milligrams of TMP per kilo per day. I'm going to multiply that by 10 kilograms. So it should be equaling 100 milligrams of TMP per day, right? Because your kilograms will, will cancel out at that point, right? So then to get the per dose amount, so per dose, it's going to be 100 oops, milligrams divided by two doses per day, right? Mm -hmm. So then basically you're going to get 50 milligrams of TMP per day, or per dose, I should say. Make sense? Yes, ma'am. Yep, if you look back on the thing, it says... And divided doses every 12 hours for 10 days, okay? Yeah, so that will always be included on there. So, again, if it says, like, per day, it needs to tell you how often they're going to be taking it, whether it's every 8 hours, every 6 hours, every 12 hours, whatever it happens to be, okay? All right, so good. So we got that information. Now what do we need to look at? It's a kid. What kind of doses form am I going to use? Probably a liquid, right? So, again, if I have a 2-year-old, they're not going to be able to take tablets very well. So let's go ahead and go down to our dosage forms again. And again, if you go to Hippocrates, if you go to your Tarascon, if you go to a Sanford guide, you go to Micromatic, wherever you go, it'll generally have the same information here. But I like, I like Lessie Comp. That's just what I've been using for years now, so that's what I go to. Okay, so let's look here. So we've got several different dosage forms. We have solution intravenous. Is this what I'm using? Nah, this kid's going to be outpatient, right? Just a keto I don't need to bring him in for that. So no IV. Suspension oral. Okay, that makes sense. This is what I want to use. And again, notice here I have tablets uh, that are available as well. So if I had an older kid, maybe I could use that instead, right? So again, um, you may have to round to different doses depending on what you got based on the calculation. But anyway, so let's go ahead and use this uh, the oral suspension here. And so what do you notice about some of the other stuff? Uh, it talks about you know all these different products that are in here. Why is that important? Allergies. Yeah, if they have an allergy. So for instance, um, you know if they have an issue with red number forty. Um, Red number 40 is a common one you may have some allergies to, so that would be maybe one where I'd actually want to avoid this medication because of that, right? Or if I could use a tablet, I could crush that and, and put it into water or something. That may be an option. But uh, let's assume the kid has no allergies. We're going to go ahead and use this. So, again, what do you notice here? It's sulfamethoxazole 200 milligrams and trimethoprim 40 milligrams per 5 mLs. Okay, this just tells you how big the bottle comes in the pharmacy. You don't really care about that so much. You want to know what the actual concentration is, okay? So, and that's going to be included in your prescription when you actually go to write that out, okay? So, we know this, and again, how, what are we dosing off of? 
the trimethoprim, right? So we're dosing off the trimethoprim, so I know it's 40 per 5. And again, we'll go ahead and divide that out so we know how much is actually per ml. So you always want to get down to how many um, uh, milligrams you have per ml. So again, it's uh, Bactrim, 200 milligram um, of sulfamethoxazole. 40 milligrams TMP per 5 mLs. And 5 mLs is, is otherwise known as what? Teaspoon, right? So again, that's why you see a lot of things per 5 mLs because it's, uh, you know, what, what a teaspoon is essentially. So basically, what I want to figure out, okay, well, what is 40 milligrams of TMP divided by 5 mLs? What do I get per mL? <coughs> yeah, so it should be 8 milligrams per mL here, right, of, of trimethoprim. So again, now I know my concentration. I know how much I'm going to be administering to this patient. So I need to get from milligrams of trimethoprim per dose to mLs of trimethoprim that I'm actually going to administer, right? So basically what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take that 50 milligrams divided by 8 milligrams per mL, and I should get what? Let's do the math. I don't actually have it on the top of my head. <coughs> math is hard, okay? 6.25, perfect. Thank you, Val. Uh, so 6.25 mLs. Per dose or per day? Per dose. Remember, we got it down to the dose already. So, again, this child will be administered 6.25 mLs per dose. Okay? So, how would we actually write that script? So, assume we have all the other information already present there. Let's go ahead and um, actually write the script itself. So, what do I start with? So I could write Bactrim, or I could write sulfamethoxazole trimethoprim. Again, it doesn't matter if I write brand or generic in this case. Um, so, let's say I'm going to write Bactrim suspension. Now, if it comes as a syrup and you write suspension, am I going to count off on you? Probably not. I don't really care that much. Uh, but if it's going to, if it needs to be like an oral liquid, make sure that you actually pick the oral liquid, uh, and you need to include the concentration. Because, uh, for instance, if you look at your amoxicillin, there's a ton of different concentrations that are available. Which one do you think is better for kids, though? Less concentrated, more concentrated? If it's more concentrated, what does that do to my volume I have to administer? I have to give less of the drug, less volume, to get the same dose into the patient. Is that a good thing? Yes. Giving 20 mLs to a, a child who's fighting, a toddler, uh, is much different than giving 2 mLs of a drug. And so I can tell you the 2 mLs is a lot easier to administer. It's less likely to spit, or if they do spit it out, you have less uh, of it on your face. So less volume is better from a pediatric standpoint, okay? So we're going to say back from suspension. We're going to say 200 milligrams sulfa methoxazole slash 40 milligrams trimethoprim. Per 5 mLs. Or you could write just per 5 mLs if you want, right? So that way we know the concentration, right? So that way when the pharmacist gets it, they can pick the right bottle off the line. Uh, with Bactrim, there's only one that's available, so that makes it less uh, confusing. However, but amoxicillin, augmentin, all of this has multiple concentrations. You want to make sure you get the right one, okay? So I've got my, my drug name here. I have the concentration. And now what do I want to put? Now I can put my directions for use, right? So I have the actual drug itself and the, the concentrations. I want to say take what? 6.25 mLs. Um, you could round it, but remember we went off the, we, we said 6 to 10 milligrams of trimethoprim per day. Uh, if anything, I'd probably round down in this case. I might say 6 mLs, right? Um, you know, if we were still in a day where we had to deal with like teaspoons and things like that, it probably would have gotten round down to five, you know. Um, but because we now we have like the availability of dosing syringes, you know, it's, it's easier to do that. If you round down to six, I wouldn't probably count off on it as long as within like kind of a 10% sort of margin there. Yeah. Um, so let's just go 6.25 for this purposes here just so we can do the math. Uh, so we're going to take 6.25 mLs. What next? What's the route? By mouth. Yep. So we're going to say PO twice a day. How can I write that out? BID, so I got to do BID. What else got to do? Every 12 hours, I could also do twice daily. So any of those would be totally fine. So I could write BID. I could write Q12 hours. I could write uh, twice daily. Any of those would be totally fine. Okay, pick, take your pick. Yes, sir. Did you write 2x daily? Um, I would stray away from that because... That's not like a common common way of writing it. And again, when you're doing like this via like electronic medical records of it, writes out everything anyway. There actually won't be any uh, abbreviations here. But for in the cases where you're still writing hand prescriptions, two um, x day, someone could probably figure that out. But it's not common that we do that. So I probably write one of these is is uh, more uh, error proof, I guess. Error resistant, I should say. Nothing's really error proof, right? Um, okay, so it says take take uh, six point two five mLs by mouth twice daily. What next? Is this a med they're going to take forever? Yeah, so if you go back to your um, dosing here. 
So within, uh, especially with antibiotics, it's important to know like how long you're actually going to be treating for. So here, every 12 hours for 10 days. Okay, and that's important because that's going to inform what quantity we're going to be dispensing of the drug here, right? So in that case, I would go ahead and say uh, for 10 days, right? So next, I want to get my quantity to dispense. So quantity would be what? So you figure out how much they're taking per day, right? So 6.25 times 2, which is what? 12.5 mLs times how many days? 10 days. So 12.5 times 10 is? 125 mLs. So I could just say quantity 125 mLs. Now, if you write for a little overfill, uh, I don't care about that. Now, the one thing I do see some uh, some students doing is remember when we looked at the dosage forms um, a second ago. Of course, that didn't work. Uh, let's go back down. So we get we let's see, kinetics. Take the dosage forms. I don't want pricing. Here we go. Um, now, notice here, this is the size bottle that it comes in. Um, do you think we needed 125 mLs? Am I going to dispense that whole 473? You know how many, uh, what, what 473 mLs is equate to? It's almost half a liter, true. There's also equate to as far as like a common, like, say, like uh, volumes. It's a pint, basically, right? So you'd have a pint of drug, essentially. Uh, but anyway, uh, a little trivia there. But um, 473 mLs is, is what the actual bottle comes from, like, the uh, from you know, our, our suppliers. We would not dispense that whole amount. And, again, oftentimes insurance companies do not want to pay for that full amount because it's more drug than they need, right? They can get probably three courses out of that, and that's not what, what was really required for that patient. So you, if you write for 130, if you write for 140, that's probably within reason because, um, again, you may have some cases where the kid's spitting some out at you. There's probably a little overfill from the pharmacy anyway because, again, we're kind of measuring, we're kind of doing this by eye when we're filling these bottles. So we usually tend to go over than, than under, right? If you're doing, like, a C2 or something, then we want to be a little bit more exact, but in this case, it's okay if we go over. No, no harm uh, will be done by this, okay? Good. So we're going to do 125 mLs, so we'll just put that. Uh, and then what's our refills? Do I do any refills? No. If they have recurrence of infection, do I want them to be treating themselves? No. What if it's a resistant bug, or what if it's a totally another uh, uh, type of infection altogether? You don't want to put any refills. So here, I'll just put zero refills, right? Um, so that way, you can make sure that um, they get another infection. They come back to you to assess, like, is this the right drug for them again, or do I do something different? Do you need an indication for this one? Yes. Uh, sorry. Uh, thank you for keeping me straight. So what would the indication for this one be? Yeah, so you could write AOM or ketotitis media, any of those would be fine, right? So that's good because you can differentiate between like if it's for cellulitis or, or whatever happens to be, UTI. Um, good, thank you for reminding. See, even I forget some things sometimes, but if you follow the rubric, you cannot go wrong, right? Okay, everyone, does that make sense? Does that help alleviate a few anxieties, hopefully? Maybe? No? That's okay. Once you get a few under your belt, you'll be fine. Uh, again, this one's just pass-fail. Just try to include everything on there, and I will still give you feedback as if I was grading it for real, but it, as long as you turn in something, it'll, it'll be pass, right? Okay, everyone ready for the review? Maybe? We're going to do a Kahoot review. Unless you guys don't want a review. You want one? Okay, all right, let's do it. People sign up. You know, someone, um, I, one time I had a cashier, uh, I was, I, was, uh, I handed over my, my credit card or something to pay for something, and they were like, uh, Adam Wood what? And I was like, huh? <laughs> Adam, and, uh, and she was like, well, Adam would not get this joke. And I was like, dang, she got me. <laughs> anyway, so I saw an Adam Wood. Speaking of utter despair, what do you call a cow with two legs? Lean beef. What do you call a cow with no legs? Yeah? Ground beef, good. Uh, what do you call a cow with epilepsy? Beef jerky. Wait for two more. Are we missing anyone? There's one. Okay, you guys need to. I cannot help you with that issue. Wait, hold on. I'm not sending it. Okay. 
All eyes are on you. Okay, so let's go ahead and it's your job. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Now I know who you are specifically. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay, let's let's go through this. Some of them will be a little bit longer because they, they involve some calculations, so be ready for that. Okay, which of the following is true about the intravenous route of administration? It has the highest bioavailability. Medications given accidentally can be removed easily. As a slow onset of action or extravasation means a med is placed in an artery. <coughs> Very good. Yes, as the highest bioavailability, it should be what percentage bioavailable? 100%, absolutely good. Um, what about the blue answer? Medications given accidentally can be removed easily? Once it's in, it's in, you're done, right? Uh, slow onset of action? One of the fastest, right? It's very, very fast onset of action. Uh, what's extravasation mean? Yeah, basically it infiltrates outside of the vein, essentially, right? Or I could have like an intra-arterial uh, administration that goes outside of the artery. That would still be considered extravasation, right? So again, anything that goes extra vasation out of the vein, essentially, is what that's referring to. Uh, is that a problem? It can be, especially depending on the drug. You may find some things are extreme vesicants, and it will cause severe tissue damage, right? So you got to be really careful with that. That's why it's really important, like, either if you're starting a line or the nurse is starting a line, make sure they have good flow um, in, that, in that, uh, that line there. Okay. Let's see. We have a 4-year-old, 17-kilogram patient with dehydration. They present to the ER. What's the maintenance rate of fluid that patient would need based off the 4 2, 1 rule? Do you remember the 4 2, 1 rule? I remember it. <laughs> Do you? If you can go on a rotation, like a pizza rotation, and you can bust this out like second nature, you guys look like rock stars, I guarantee you. Oh, good. Just, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, and you can come forward if you like. If you, I had some people sitting on the floor last time around. It's a 17 mLs per hour, 68 mLs per hour, 54 mLs per hour, or 47 mLs per hour. A little late now considering it's over. Um, okay, so the correct answer would be 54 mLs per hour. So based on the 4 2, 1 rule, what does that mean? So it means for the patient for the first 10 kilograms, and I'll just write this out actually. You can do that, no problem. I'll say, okay, so we have a 17 kilogram patient, right? So that means for the first 10 kilograms, it gets what? Four is 421, right? So it's going to be four mLs per kilogram per hour, oops, per hour, times 10 kilograms equals what? 40 mLs per hour, right? So again, already we're already at 40 mLs per hour the patient should be uh, receiving. And then for the next 10, the second 10 kilograms, it's going to be what? 2 mLs per kilogram per hour. Now, with this patient, he doesn't have a full set of, uh, full second 10 kilograms. What do I multiply this by? Seven. By 7 kilograms, and that equals 14 mLs per hour. So that means the patient should get a total of... 54 mLs per hour, right? Again, you can't really go wrong by using this method. You're not going to over uh, uh, give too much fluid unless the patient already has, like, you know, say, fluid retention issues or they're edematous already. Uh, this is a good way to do that, okay? All right. Next up. Which of the following differentiates a toxicant from a toxin? So definitions will be a thing on the test. I would know definitions. Because, again, this is a kind of a broad sort of uh, uh, class. Broad concepts are good to know. Definitions are good to know. Uh, so the first one says toxicants are harmful. Toxins are non-biologic in origin. Most pharmaceuticals are toxins, or toxicants are non-biological in origin. <coughs> so. 
what differentiates a toxin from a toxicant. All right. Good. Most people knew that. So good. Um, so again, toxicants and toxins both can be harmful. Right? That's, how they, that's basically how they're, why they're, they have toxins in front of them, right? So again, they can all both be harmful. Um, toxins are non-biologic in origin. Is that correct? No, they're biologic in origin. So if I had like snake venom or if I had uh, Botox from uh, the Clostridium botulinum, uh, that would be considered to be uh, toxins. Those are of biologic origin. Good. Uh, most pharmaceuticals are toxins. No, because most of them are going to be toxicants because they're synthetic chemicals, and which is why toxicants are non-biologic in origin. All right, so that kind of informs that one. Good. The definitions, good to know. All right. The receptor that becomes phosphorylated then dimerizes to initiate a cellular action is? Is it a ion-gated channel? Is it a tyrosine kinase channel? An intracellular receptor or a G-protein coupled receptor? Good. Yeah, so remember the tyrosine kinase ones, are they had to have, and think of insulin as a good example of this one, where they had to have two molecules bind to the two separate inactive proteins. They come together, they both get phosphorylated, and then they activate a second uh, second messenger system there, right? Um, on the flip side, like an ion-gated channel, those are just channels that open or close based on if something binds to it, uh, leading to ions to flow either in or out, right? So again, that's just an ion-gated channel. Um, what about intracellular receptor? What would be an example of that? Uh, not really. That's more of like a secondary messenger system. Uh, yeah, like steroids working at the nucleus, right? So if you imagine someone binding to and like say changing gene transcription, that's a really good example of an intracellular sort of receptor, right? It's anywhere actually within the cell. The rest of these are all cell surface receptors, okay? Um, and then G protein coupled. Remember what those look like? Like seven transmembrane segments there, but again, they uh, once they get bound, then you're going to see the inactive G proteins get activated once they're phosphorylated with GTP. If you remember that, okay? Good. All right. For cocaine, which of the following routes of administration has the fastest onset of action? I think we talked about this one briefly. Is it insufflation, inhalation, injection, or ingestion? You know what insufflation is? Snorting. So again, this goes back to the routes of administration. Where is the drug going? Where is it being absorbed from? And then where does it go to for its side of action? Good. So what's the, the point uh, of this is showing the, that when you have like a drug that's very well inhaled from the pulmonary system, once it gets absorbed, because again, we know that the, uh, the lungs are very well vascularized, right? So they can have good oxygen exchange. Um, we see that where does it, where does the blood go from the lungs? To the left side of the heart, right up to the brain, essentially, right? If I inject something into a vein, where's it going to? So all the way to the venous side, it's got to go to the right side of the heart, it's got to go to the lungs, but then to the left side of the heart. So you can see sometimes you can kind of cut things, uh, get a shortcut by using a different route of administration, right? So you can just know that how the different routes, uh, depending on the type of drug you're dealing with, can, can modify its effects pretty dramatically, okay? So people get very, very quick highs, very intense highs off of uh, inhaled cocaine, it tends to be more addictive than you even see with like in, uh, intravenously administered or especially like snorted uh, cocaine, right? And not from personal use, but in, generally in, in patients we deal with. Okay. Why do graded dose response curves exhibit a plateau at the upper end of the doses studied? Is it when lethality occurs? Does it occur when all available receptors are bound? It occurs due to tachyphylaxis or it occurs when receptors start to downregulate? Remember, does the graded dose response curve look at just one person or a whole group of people? Typically, the quantal responses, right? That's when it's like sleep, yes or no, right? Dead, alive or dead. Um, that's going to be more of a quantal response in a group of individuals. Usually, the graded responses are going to be on a single like, tissue or a single person or uh, just a single subject generally.
Good. Yeah. So when you see those curves, basically it's, uh, you get that plateau effect. Once all the receptors are being bound up, doesn't matter how much more drug I give, I can't get any more effect out of it because all the receptors are bound up, right? It's all saturated. Um, now, what is tachyphylaxis? Sure, yeah, so it could be a case where I have to give time between doses in order to make sure I retain effect, but it's the, the actual definition is it doesn't matter how much more drug I give, I don't see any more effect out of it um, because of usually depleting cofactors or uh, some other mechanism there where I have like kind of a desensitization uh, of the body, right? So like nitroglycerin is a really good example. I have to have a nitrate-free period, usually 12 hours or so, to give the body a chance to reset. That way, when the next time they have chest pain, if I give them nitro, it's actually going to work, right? Um, and again, usually uh, that takes some time to occur, but can be pretty rapid for some drugs. And then the down regulation is typically going to be more of a chronic thing that happens over time, right? Again, when you're looking at a graded dose response curve, it's happening, um, you know, during a kind of an acute sort of uh, exposure to that drug itself. Okay. Oops. Which of the following occurs after chronic administration of a competitive antagonist at a receptor? The cell will remove receptors from the cell surface. The cell will increase release of drug metabolizing enzymes. The cell will increase the number of receptors at the cell surface. Or the cell will remove all receptors from the cell surface. What do you think happens here? And again, sometimes I have character limitations, so I have to get creative with how I abbreviate things. So it doesn't increase the hashtag of receptors, but number of receptors. Hashtag receptors. <laughs> the competitive antagonist. All right, so remember when a competitive antagonist binds to that receptor, how much activity does it have? It's an antagonist, so zero activity, right? It's blocking the receptor. Think of beta blockers blocking the beta receptors so epinephrine can't come and activate it, right? So it's a competitive antagonist. So do you expect this uh, receptors to upregulate or downregulate? They upregulate, right? Because the cell is detecting, hey, I'm not having enough activity here of these beta receptors. Let's increase the number so it's more available to interact with the endogenous sort of uh, uh, ligand, right? Yes, ma'am. Oh, my mic's off. I don't know the battery died again. Yes, sir. What would happen with a non-competitive? A non-competitive... Sorry. Hello, hello. Check, check. All right. Um, <laughs> the question is, uh, with a non-competitive antagonist, what would happen? Um, those are much more rare, as you'll see, like in, in clinical use. Uh, typically, um, you would also have an upregulation because, again, uh, you're having, even though it's not blocking the receptor in the traditional sense, blocking the ligand, it's still uh, preventing the ligand from working normally. So you still see the upregulation that would occur there. Yep. Okay. Which of the following methods of dosing may be most affected by extremes of weight in children? So it would be age based, body surface area based, or weight based? All right. Interesting. So again, this is which method would be most affected by the extremes of weight in children. So you may think, oh, weight-based. Actually, that's not the case. What you actually find is age-based dosing. Because, again, when I'm looking at age-based dosing, does that take the weight of the child into account at all? No. So I could have a very uh, underweight child. I could have an extremely overweight child. That would not be factored in. It just says you're two, guess what? You get this dose. You're five, you get this dose. That is going to be affected by the extremes of, of weight uh, pretty dramatically, as you'll see. Okay. Now, looking at weight-based Again, that will take that into account. However, you can still have kids that are you know, fairly overweight. We talked about adipose tissue being uh, an issue there, affecting things like volume distribution, et cetera. So when looking at body surface area, why do you think that would be the least affected? 
So it factors in the weight of the child, but also factors in what? The height of the patient as well, right? So again, you can find, and we see this pretty frequently. So a good example, when I was doing, uh, we do uh, chemo calculations, right? So our kids getting chemotherapy. Um, we will have their current weights and we'll also have their body surface area. Most chemo drugs are based off of body surface area. I can have a kid that can change their weight between, uh, between visits by several kilograms, However, even when I factor that into uh, the, the BSA calculation, the body surface area, their height really hasn't changed much at all, and you very see very small changes in that body surface area. So that makes sure that even if you have a big change in weight, uh, the height stays relatively the same. You shouldn't see a big change in, in the dose from that standpoint. So body surface area would be the least affected by extremes of weight because you're also factoring the kid's height. Okay? All right. Good job, Shania Twain. This is like a fallback career, potentially. <laughs> Okay, uh, which change could decrease the volume of distribution for a hydrophilic medication? Increased tissue protein binding, increased plasma protein binding, dehydration, or edema? So we're going to decrease the volume of distribution for a hydrophilic drug. Keep in mind, I can put more than one right answer on these. I will not do so on the test. Don't forget your free answer if you win. This one's going to be a doozy. Sweet. <coughs> All right, there's two correct answers here, so good job. Um, right, so increased tissue protein binding would do what? That would increase the volume of distribution because the more drug that's being tightly bound out at the tissues means it's going to be more out of the tissues, which means volume of distribution goes up in those circumstances, right? How about edema? Why would that not uh, decrease volume of distribution? Yeah, you have a lot more fluid in the, in the interstitium. You have a lot more fluid out there uh, in the extracellular fluid. So, again, that drug is then partitioned out of the bloodstream. So, that would increase the volume of distribution. Remember, we talked about little kids like neonates, big bags of water, right? Hydrophilic meds, you have to give a lot bigger dose on a per kilo basis because they have such a high volume of distribution for hydrophilic meds as compared to adults, right? So, again, that would be uh, true. Increased plasma protein bindings in the blood. So, again, that's going to be keeping it all there. So, that makes sense. That would decrease the volume of distribution. And then dehydration, blood gets more concentrated. Again, that would also decrease the volume of distribution as well. Okay? All right. Which of these drugs would be safest? So, we're going to compare effective dose 50s to toxic dose 50s. Is it 5 milligrams to 5 grams? 5 milligrams to 25 milligrams? 5 milligrams to 50 milligrams, or 5 milligrams to 500 milligrams? Which would be the safest based on the therapeutic index? I hear a lot of people going, oh, I missed the units. Always remember the units. So, okay, so how do we figure out the therapeutic index? Yeah, so we're looking at the space between the, the, the TD50 and the ED50. Again, alternatively, I could have put LD50 on here instead of TD50. They're both the same as far, it's just a matter of what kind of outcome we're looking at. In this case, though, uh, you want the biggest ratio possible. So what's in my numerator? The TD50 is in the numerator. The denominator is going to be the ED50, right? You wouldn't ever want an ED50 bigger than your TD50 because that means the drug would only be effective at toxic doses. We don't want to do that, right? So not great. So we're going to look for the biggest ratio between the toxic dose 50 to the ED50. In this case, which one has the biggest ratio? Some of you might have looked at 5 and 5 and said, like, oh, that's the same. Of course, we can't use that drug. They have no... There's, it's all overlap. That's not great. However, look at the units, 5 milligrams to 5 grams, right? So I'd have to give a thousand-fold more drug to get to that TD50. That's a heck of a lot more drug. That's a very wide therapeutic index because, again, 5 grams is how many milligrams? 
5,000 milligrams, right? So again, if you change that into 5,000, you'd see that, yes, that is absolutely the biggest ratio there. Always look at your units, right? If I put micrograms on here, milligrams, grams, kilograms, keep a, uh, an eye on that, right? And be able to know the difference, okay? All right. I got a lot of you guys on that one. That's pretty good. <laughs> Two thirds. Uh, in phase one trials for a new drug, who are the test subjects? Patients with the disease state, pregnant patients and children, patients without the disease state, or laboratory animals? I guess we're all animals, aren't we? Good. Patients without the disease state is the correct answer here. Good. So when do we do uh, pregnant patients and children? Usually you don't. Yeah. Uh, only the third trimester. No, uh, you really can't do that, right? Because what's the issue with uh, pregnant patients and children? They're a highly at-risk patient population, right? So I can't just give drugs willy-nilly to uh, pregnant women because if their kids pop out with like two heads, that's kind of on me, right? So I don't want to do that. Um, so pregnant patients are protected class children as well because can they really give consent? It's much more difficult, right? So again, they have to. Uh, it's very, uh, very difficult to do studies in kids. Um, so again, those are generally not going to be included in a lot of these clinical trials, right? Good. Uh, laboratory animals. When do they get tested on? Preclinical testing, right? So the drug companies have to come to the FDA saying, "Hey, we all have all this information in in mice and monkeys and whoever else uh, to show that yes, we think this drug is going to be a good candidate for people, and then they will approve that and give that uh, investigational new drug application to to the company, right? Yeah, how long does that last? Now, that patent, they have 20 years on that patent. As soon as they submit it to the FDA, you get 20 years to recoup their costs, right? So, again, they have to get through all the trials. If it takes them 15 years to get through trials before it goes on the market, they have five years to make their money back, okay? If it takes them only five years, they have 15 years to make their money back. Always 20, okay? So, um, now, in the phase one trials, what are we looking for? We're looking for side effects. We're looking for safety profiles. Which for, what kind of dose are we looking for? It's always going to be patients who are healthy, right? They do not have the disease state in question, Okay. How many people are we looking at? Yeah, like 10 to 100, like not a lot of patients, right? Then we get into phase two trials. Who are we looking at? <laughs> patients with the disease state. Good. And how, what's the number? Yeah, maybe a couple hundred people, right? So again, you get a bigger number. And then for phase three, who are we looking at? People with the disease state. And then now we're getting up to several hundred, maybe to a few thousand, right? Good. And then phase four trials, who's that? Everybody taking the drug, right? So, again, if you take a drug today, you're part of a phase four trial. So, if you kill over dead, then they can uh, investigate and see if the drug was related to that, report it up, and that may be involved in, you know, taking the drug off the market or a new black box warning, whatever it happens to be. Okay, so post-marketing trials or phase four trials where everyone who takes the drug is a, is a participant. Okay? All right. All right, let's say we have a 70-kilogram male. He takes 400 milligrams of a drug with a volume of distribution of 2.4 liters per kilogram. What's his initial concentration? Is it 0.42 milligrams per liter, 5.7 milligrams per liter, 167 milligrams per liter, or 2.4 milligrams per liter? Remember, C0 equals dose over VD. It's a good relationship to keep in mind. I will give you easy stuff to divide on the test. This is more difficult than what will be on the test. So don't freak out. But use your calculator here, not on the test. C0 equals dose over VD. Should have put a I have no clue option to see. Yes, sir. Shh. Yep. 
idea of the equation, or should we memorize certain equations? I would know this this particular equation, that because you want to know the relationship between the concentration you actually get versus the dose I'm giving the patient based on that volume of distribution. If I modify any of those, what is that going to do, right? If I change the volume of distribution, how does that modify the concentration? If I change the dose, obviously that's going to have an effect on the concentration. That's a very good thing to know for the test. All right, good job. You got that one correct. So let's look at the steps. Let's actually type it out here. Right, so. Okay. All right, so let's say we have, uh, let's see, let's go ahead and put our C0, 0, zero equals dose divided by VD. Okay, good. So what's our first step here? Find VD, right? What's the patient's VD in this case? So we know it's 2.4 liters per kilogram. We're going to multiply that by 70 kilos, right? Because that's how much a patient weighs. And that should equal out to be what? So I do 2.4 times 70 equals 168. Good. So we got 168. What? What's my units here? Liters. Good. So liters, because uh, I've now taken the patient's weight, I factored that into the equation here. Good. Okay. So now my C0 equals, when I have, what's my dose? 400 milligrams divided by 168 liters. Okay, now what do I get? So 400 divided by 168. I get 2.38, otherwise 2.4 milligrams per ml. Everyone got that down? Again, I will have easy math multiplied by 10, divided by 10. You know, it'll be round enough math where you can do it uh, with scratch paper. No calculator zooming needed. Okay, yes, ma'am. Can you say it again? Um, you would factor that. So if I said something like, hey, it's only 50% bio, bio available, then yes, you would factor that in. I'm probably not going to be that mean. So you still need to know about bioavailability, but we could factor that in if we wanted to, right? Unless I put uh, something on there that says it's given orally, just assume it's IV, okay, for our purposes. So just assume 100% bioavailability unless I say otherwise. All right. Uh, which of the following has an inverse effect on aqueous diffusion across a biologic membrane? Is it surface area, difference in concentration, lipophilicity, or thickness of the membrane? Looking for an inverse relationship. So if I increase this value, diffusion goes down. All right, the thickness of the membrane has an inverse relationship here. Good. So imagine if I have a bigger surface area to put drug on, what does that do to my uh, diffusion? Increases it, right? So more surface area to work with, just like in the GI tract. We said we have a huge surface area. It's like a tennis court so that we can absorb nutrients better. Right? Same thing applies here, okay? Uh, difference in concentration. If I have a bigger delta, I have more drug on the outside than on the inside. As I increase that concentration difference, more flux is going to occur. Good. Uh, lipophilicity. It's just how easy the molecule can cross over that membrane. So the more lipophilic it is, the easier time it's going to have crossing over there, right? Uh, however, though, the thicker the membrane, just like if I put um, drugs onto my hands, which may be callous, versus if I put it, say, somewhere like the axilla, which should be, uh, you know, thinner skin, you'd have better absorption in, in that case there, right? So think about the thickness of the membrane you're dealing with, okay? All right. How long does a drug company have on a patent to make their money before it expires? <laughs> Good thing I... Over talk. Does she leave? Oh, okay, she had her answer. Good. Right, it's twenty years. Good job, everyone. How'd you know? Wait, how did some of you guys get it wrong? 
20 years. They had 20 years to make their money back. They had to do the, all the trials within that 20 years. Four of you. Come meet me after. I'm just kidding. 20 years. Okay. Which of the following categories has the least amount of abuse potential? So going back to controlled substances. Schedule one. Uh, schedule four is the first one here because it randomized the answer. Schedule one, three, or two. The least amount of abuse potential. Least likely to cause addiction. When you use it, try to get high. Least amount. Yeah, I could have put C1, C2, C3. That would have been acceptable as well to put down here. Perfect. C4, or Schedule 4, has the least amount of abuse potential. Because, again, this goes in kind of like uh, reverse order, where the higher, uh, the lower the number is, the more abuse potential it has, right? Um, so Schedule 4, what would be less than Schedule 4? Schedule 5. Schedule 5 are like the wimpiest uh, sort of narcotics out there, the least amount of abuse potential. Um, now, what's the difference between Schedule 1 and 2? Sure, one you can prescribe, one you can't, right? What's But what is the thing that actually uh, in the law differentiates the two? Like no, medical no medical use, right? It may have a medical benefit, right? So you may have marijuana has reported medical benefits. However, no acceptable medical use. Again, this is according to who? The the DEA, yes, the feds, the Drug Enforcement Agency. So again, uh, Schedule 1, there is no acceptable medical use. Schedule <coughs> 2, there is an acceptable medical use. Cocaine's a C2 because we can use it for uh, topical uh, preparation for surgery. Uh, marijuana federally is not. It's a C1, right? No acceptable medical use. All right. Even though you can go to Washington, D.C. and it's available for medical use, which is kind of ironic, I think. I guess someone should have done a Landis Moore set rather than Shania Twain. Anyway, um, what's the standard expiration dating for a prescription for a non-controlled substance? How many months do we have? Uh, one year, six months, ten years, or thirty days for a non-controlled substance? Good. Yes, for non-controlled substances, you have a year on that prescription. So even if you write for 100,000 refills, guess what? After a year, it's done. No longer valid. Um, what is six months, though? Which control substances? Three, four, and five, right? Three, four, and five are going to be six months. C2s are? Days, days. Yeah, you could write up to 90 days worth. I mean, 90 days is probably you know, the, the extent of that. But again, no refills on those anyway. So again, once you fill it, it's done at that point, right? Good. All right, up next. What type of elimination is pictured here in this graph? So again, we're looking at the uh, elimination of the drug. Is it first order, zero order? Is it aqueous-based kinetics or saturated kinetics? Good. That is first order kinetic. So let me show the picture again. Right. So what do you notice about when the concentration is high versus when the concentration is low about the drug metabolism? Is more drug being eliminated here or more drug being eliminated here? It's more as the concentration is larger, right? So first order kinetic, we have the same percentage of drug being metabolized for a given period of time versus when we have zero order kinetics, right? Zero order means the same amount of drug metabolized per unit of time. So what would a zero order kinetic, uh, elimination look like? Straight linear line. Yes, absolutely. So again, did I answer your question? 
Yes. So that would just be a straight line. Now, if I were to take, like, say, the logarithm of the time, like, that would then straighten out the line there, but we wouldn't be showing it like that. Um, so, again, this is what a first order kinetics order looks like. And again, do most drugs follow first or zero order kinetics? First order. Majority of drugs, and again, unless it's otherwise specified, first order kinetics are going to be for all the drugs we're going to talk about. Right? <laughs> Alcohol is like the one really good example that it follows zero order kinetics. Good. Okay, what would be the half life of this drug? Hmm. What is half life? The amount of time for half the drug to be eliminated. How long does it take to go from eight uh, to four? Two hours. Good. And then from four to two? Two hours. So what would you say the half life of this drug is? Two hours. Perfect. Yeah, good. So again, you can look at difference in concentration and be able to figure out the, the, the half life based on that. Okay. So you can be able to look at the concentration. Okay. From the time it took it to go from four, or from eight to four, that was two hours. From time from four to two, it was two hours. So again, it's a two hour half life. Good. Okay, so we have a drug we're dosing. Uh, you have two minutes for this one. The drug is acetaminophen. We're dosing at 15 milligrams per kilogram. The concentration is 160 milligrams per five mLs, and the patient weighs 30 kilograms or 13 kilograms, I should say. What is the volume you have to administer? And again, I had really bad con uh, uh, number of characters I could include in here, so that's why it looks a little goofy. We're giving acetaminophen 15 milligrams per kilogram. The suspension is 160 per five, and the patient weighs 13 kilograms. What is the volume I need to administer per dose for that patient? No, you cannot bring an abacus to the test either. Okay. Use your noodle. Remember, if you keep your units included and follow those along when you're doing your calculations, it makes it a lot easier because you make sure things are canceling out appropriately. Because, again, what's the unit we should end with? ML. So, again, make sure everything else cancels out to make sure you're doing it correctly. Again, this is harder than what will be on the test, right? Because, again, this is not round, easy numbers. Oh, wow. I have some people. Don't worry. Like I said, the math will be easier on the actual test itself. And you got 75 minutes. So, again, a lot of these questions, the definitions, you can blow through those. These ones you may want to take a little bit more time on it. Make sure you double check yourself. The math works out. Okay. The answer here is 6 mLs. Let's work through to see how we got that. Okay. So let's bring this back up. Let's say we're going to go down. All right. So, let's say we have our drug here. What's the first step I want to do? I want to figure out what the dose my patient's going to get is going to be. Okay, so let's go ahead and figure out what his actual dose needs to be here. So I'm going to multiply what? Yep, so 15 mg per kilogram times 13 kilograms. Okay, we equals what? If I do that, do 15 times 13. So the patient should be getting 195 milligrams per dose, right? That's per dose. Okay. So now I've got to figure out, okay, well, I know the dose, but I need to figure out how much volume I'm actually going to be administering for that patient because it's a, it's a liquid medication, right? So now i got to figure out how much my drug is per ml, okay? So I'm just going to take 160 milligrams divided by 5 mLs, right, equals what? 32 milligrams per ml. And again, I don't know who decided, like, 32 milligrams per ml is, like, a good thing because I always hate to see them in for that, like, Ibuprofen, it's 20. It's easy. Uh, 32, that's a little harder to do, right? But anyway, so now we know the concentration of our acetaminophen uh, suspension here, okay? So now what do I want to do? So I need to get from that 195 milligrams per dose, I need to divide it by 32 milligrams per ml, okay? I'm going to take that 195. I'm going to 
divide that by, I'm sorry, let me do that milligrams per dose, milligrams per dose. And I'm going to divide that by 32 milligrams per ml. Okay? That means uh, what's canceling out? My milligram should cancel out, right? So I'm also, uh, left over with what? I'm basically left over with mLs per dose, essentially, right? So I'm going to take 195 divided by 32. You get 6.09375. Now, is that what you write on the script? Just write 6. That's fine. We could write 6.1. That'd be fine, too. But 6 is all right. Okay? I'm going to say 6 mLs per dose. Keep your units straight. You can't go wrong if you keep your units with you and you make sure you cancel things out appropriately, right? Figure out what the actual end, uh, the actual uh, answer is going to be in. In this case, it's mLs per dose. Figure that out, what you need, and then how do you actually work backwards to get to that essentially, right? But this is the process we do anytime we're prescribing medications uh, to children. We have to figure out this uh, uh, out every single time, right? Okay, that makes sense. Okay. All right. Uh, metoprolol, or toprol is a brand name, is considered a beta blocker. How would you classify this drug? Would it be a competitive antagonist, an indirect agonist, an inverse agonist, or an agonist? The beta blocker. All right, so what can you tell based off the, the categorization there? So it's a beta blocker. So is it going to be an agonist or an antagonist, do you think? It's an antagonist. So what does that rule out? Everything else, right? So we'll walk through those. So anyway, so in this case, it would be a competitive antagonist. And in general, when you're dealing with antagonists, most of them are going to be competitive, right? There's going to be some non-competitive ones, but in general, they're competitive, okay? Because it's going to be in direct competition with whatever the natural ligand is. So what binds to beta receptors? We should know this from physio. Epinephrine, norepinephrine, right? So again, if you're blocking that, that's considered being an antagonist, right? So okay. Um, an inverse agonist, what does that do? Anyone know? We talked about this very briefly. It actually ends up binding to the receptor and actually does the opposite effect. These are exceedingly rare. We're not going to really talk about those ever, but those actually end up doing the opposite of where the action is. So for instance, if normally the ligand would reduce, say, blood pressure, this would actually go and increase blood pressure. Again, clinically, we don't see those very often. An indirect agonist would just be something that works other than the actual receptor site. So for instance, like we look at a, a GABA receptor that normally allows for GABA to bind to it, something like a Xanax, right? Whoever needs a Xanax applies to you, um, can actually bind to another site to allow that GABA to work better. So it's sort of an indirect sort of agonist in that case. And just a regular agonist just binds to the receptor and activates it. Okay. So again, just based off this, you would be able to know it's a beta blocker, it's a competitive antagonist. Okay. Uh, which of the following is not required but recommended on a prescription for safe use? Would it be the strength of the medication, the provider signature, the medication brand name, or the PRN indications? Not required, but definitely recommended for safe use. It's something I will count off on if you don't include on your prescription in future classes. All right, good. Um, yeah, so do you need the strength of medication? Yes. yes, you have to include that, right? So that way we actually know what the heck we're dispensing out. Oh, so again, it's the tablet size or the concentration of the product. We need to have that. Good. Provider signature, do you have to have that? Yep. Yes, you have to have someone sign off of that. Does it have to be handwritten? Depends, Depends on the drug. If it's a C2, yeah, you have to handwrite it. Can you use a stamp for other ones, for non-controlled substances? Yep. Absolutely. You can electronically sign it. You can stamp it, whatever you want. No big deal, right? Uh, medication brand name. 
generally you don't have to include that, right? So it's not required. It's one of those things. As long as you have the generic and you can tell what that is, then then you're good to go. So again, you don't very frequently do not include the brand name, or if you just write the brand name, we'll be able to figure out what generic to, to sub it with in those cases. However, PRN indications not required by law. However, very good to have on there. So for instance, and again, it's good for things like you know. Um, uh, you know, so if you had a script, it just says, hey, take this as needed. Well, what is it as needed for? Like the patient may forget, right? They have uh, issues with memory impairment. Like when do I take this medication? Is it when I'm feeling bloated or do I take this medication for when I have pain? Those are the things you want to include because whatever you write on that script goes on that bottle and that's all they got to work off of, okay? So again, really good to have uh, PRN indications included. Uh, otherwise, uh, the patient is going to be, could be left in the dark, right? All right. Okay, let's say we have a drug A, which is 100 milligrams daily to lower blood pressure by 15%, and then drug B is 10 milligrams daily to lower blood pressure by 15%. Would you say drug B is less effective? Would you say drug A is more effective? Drug A is more potent, or these drugs are equipotent? Saying so drug A is 100 milligrams daily to get a 15% reduction in blood pressure. Drug B is 10 milligrams daily to get a 15% reduction in blood pressure. Which one's more effective and which one's more potent? All right, so let's see what we can figure out. So which drug is more potent in this case? Drug B is more potent because I had to I used a smaller dose in order to get the same effect as drug A. So automatically you know drug B is more potent than drug A. Okay. Now which drug is more effective? You can't tell off of this. You can't tell what the maximum <coughs> efficacy would be of either of these drugs. We just know that with at both of these doses you get the same drop in blood pressure. So what, what does that mean then? Those are equipotent doses. I know if I give 10 of this drug and I give 100 of this drug, I get the same effect. Those are equipotent. Okay? Same effect, but different doses, equipotent dosing. Okay, you can't tell. Uh, we know which one's more potent because we know drug B gets the same uh, reduction of blood pressure at a lower dose, but we cannot tell which one has maximal efficacy because, again, we haven't really hit that point yet as far as we know. Yes, sir? So equipotent is when you're comparing two drugs together at different doses to get the same effect, right? So I could have drug C here that is, uh, say, 400 milligrams to get a 15% reduction. As long as I'm still comparing 15% reduction in blood pressure, I can get different doses of the different drugs, but those are equipotent doses. So for instance, I can get 50 micrograms of fentanyl IV that would be roughly equivalent to, say, 2 milligrams of IV morphine. Those are equipotent doses because I get the same rough reduction in, in uh, pain scale. Make sense? Same effect, even though they're different doses. They're equipotent doses. Okay? All right. Moving forward. Inhibition of CYP3A4 by grapefruit juice would cause which of the following outcomes? Assuming we're dealing with a drug uh, that is uh, metabolized by that. So, see, would you see rhabdomyolysis due to elevated levels of simvastatin? Or would you see hyperlipidemia worsen due to lowered levels of simvastatin? So, we're inhibiting CYP3A4 with grapefruit juice. Which would you see? You have a 50 50 shot of getting this one right. <laughs> Just assume symphostatin is metabolized by CYP3A4. Again, character limits are kind of annoying. Wow, this is right down the middle here almost. Okay, so let's look Let's look at this uh, step by step. So imagine simvastatin is a substrate of CYP3A4, which means it is metabolized by CYP3A4. Okay, so if I were to inhibit the activities of CYP3A4, what does that do to metabolism of simvastatin? It would decrease it. So what does that do to levels of simvastatin in the body? 
it would increase it, right? So in this case, I would see elevated levels. It doesn't really matter if you know anything about rhabdomyolysis or hyperlipidemia. You're looking at the levels of the drug itself. So in this case, you'd find elevated levels of simvastatin. Now on the flip side, if I had a CYP3-4 inducer, what does that happen to the levels of the enzyme? It would increase. That does what to metabolism of simvastatin? Increase it. And that does what to levels of simvastatin? I'm metabolizing it faster, so levels will drop more quickly. So in this case, I would see you would say worse than hyperlipidemia. Say, for instance, you know, someone came back for, say, a six-week check and their lipids look exactly the same. It could be because they're metabolizing that symphosatin way too quickly. Okay? So you can understand if I inhibit or induce one of these enzymes, what is the downstream effect of that as far as the drug levels go? A lot of students have a hard time with that one, kind of linking those uh, bits in your mind. But think about it. If I slow down metabolism of a drug, the level should go up. If I increase metabolism, <laughs> levels of the drug should go down. Okay? Keep that relationship in mind. Really not seeing a whole lot of change up here. Uh, Shania Twain's really just killing it. Okay. Uh, a drug is removed from the market after noting increases in mortality. What phase trial is this? I'm going to give this one away too. Phase one, three, two, or four? It was removed from the market after realizing that it increases mortality. If anyone's ever heard of Vioxx, this is a high-profile example. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, hmm? Fenton was another one that also got taken off the market because it was killing people. Yep. Although you can still get fentermine. That one's still available. That probably kills people too, but uh, was not as reported. Yes, this would be a phase four trial. Remember phase one, two, and three are the actual clinical trials. That's where you're dealing with patients, uh, smaller numbers of patients. So once the drug is out on the market and giving it to millions of people, that's when you can find those one in a million sort of side effects or you can find that increase in mortality. So it would be a phase four trial. Yeah. And anytime you're taking a drug that's on the market, you're in a phase four trial. Okay. Uh, drug epinephrine. So we're giving epinephrine to a patient. Uh, the concentration is one milligram per ml. I have a 12 kilo patient. The dose is 0 0.01 milligrams per kilogram. What's the volume of drug I need to administer? So this is a little bit, uh, a little bit more complicated than the last one. Not by much. It's an IV medication. Say we're giving this, or, uh, say we're giving this IM. Child's having anaphylaxis. They weigh 12 kilograms. The dose is 0 0.01 milligrams per kilogram, and I know the concentration is one milligram per ml. It'll look complicated, but it's actually easier than you think. <laughs> now, if I had a patient that said they have an epinephrine allergy, do you think that would be legitimate? No. Why not? Everyone has epinephrine. They produce it all the time. How could you be allergic to something you produce? So the question is, if they still had hypersensitivity, what could they be reacting to? Remember, every drug has inactive ingredients associated with it, right? So there's actually there's a preservative in some forms of epinephrine. It's called sulfite. Uh, if you include that, some patients have an allergy to that. So just like some patients can have an insulin allergy, a lot of it's related not to the insulin itself, but actually another uh, inactive component as well as a part of that. Yeah, so like if they get tachycardic from epinephrine, that's just how the drug works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, they uh, get tachycardic with epinephrine. Duh. Like it's how the drug works. The beta 1 receptor is getting hit. Okay, so the correct answer is 0.12 ml. So let's walk through how we figured that out. Okay. So, first thing I want to figure out is what? I want to figure out the dose that my patient is going to receive. So, my patient weighs 12 kilograms. I'm going to multiply that by what? 0 0.01 
milligrams per kilogram. Not a very big dose, right? So again, uh, very little bit of epinephrine can get a lot of, uh, it's a very potent drug, you get a lot of activity out of that, right? So again, that's going to equal what? Again, you just move the decimal place over two, two spots here on the 12, so one and two, so you're going to get 0 0.12, what? Milligrams, right? So that's going to be my dose. Now remember, do I want to have the zero here? Yes, because yes, if I wrote this down on an order for the nurse to follow and they missed that decimal place, what could they read that as? 12 milligrams. That would kill somebody potentially, right? So again, you do not want to goof that up. You always want that leading zero there. <coughs> but if my dose was say one milligram, do I want a trailing zero? No, because I can miss right as 10 potentially, okay? So anyway, all right, so now I have my dose. So now i got to figure out what actual volume I need to administer it. So again, with uh, as opposed to the, the acetaminophen, which it was in uh, per 5 mLs concentration, I don't have to, I don't have to do that here because I know already what the concentration of this drug is per mL. So I already know it's 1 milligram per mL, so no conversion has to happen there. Um, but what would I do at this point? So I want to figure out the volume I want to administer. So I would do 0 0.12 milligrams per dose. Let's see. What, then what would I do at this point? Divide by one <coughs> milligram per mL, and that equals what? Dividing by one is really easy, because guess what? It stays exactly the same. So this is actually 0.12 mLs per dose. So this is, and again, if you have a patient who's like actively like dying in front of you, as you might see with like pediatric patients in, uh, in code situations, figuring out that dose for that patient with epinephrine, trying to do this kind of math in your head, when you have someone like dead in front of you, is that easy to do? No, it's pretty harrowing. It's pretty tough to do. Um, and, and even people who do this for a living, like they have troubles with it. So again, this is why we like to have things like dosing references available, like things that will already be like set on a, on a weight basis for kids. Um, but if you had to make this calculation, this is how you would do it and figure out how much to actually administer to that patient. That makes sense? Okay. So remember, um, unlike the acetaminophen, I did not have to do that division by five because, again, the concentration is already in uh, one milligram per mL, so I don't have to do anything there. With that. So this one's actually a little bit easier, a little bit more straightforward. Okay. Okay. Uh, the hotness or spiciness of a pepper is rated on what scale? This is for no points, but I forgot that I put in a joke question. Is it a pain scale? Is it a child pew scale? Is it in Pemberton's or is it in Scoville's? Good, yeah, Scovels. A lot of you guys must watch your Food Network. Um, what is child pew? Anyone know what that is? It actually has to do with like liver dysfunction. So you have like different scales of liver dysfunction you see on the child pew score. Uh, but I don't remember what I did. Got Pemberton's from this is from last year, and then uh, not, not a pain scale, but Scovels. Yes, that is. So if you ever see like the Carolina Reaper or something like that, it's like you know billions of Scovels or something crazy. But that's what it's measured in. Okay. All right, last question. We have a 40 kilogram patient. He's given 100 milligrams of a drug with a resulting concentration of 16 milligrams per liter. What is the volume of distribution for this patient? Remember, C0 equals dose over VD. And clinically, this could be useful because if I have, say, someone who comes up with a concentration that does not seem right based on the dose I administer, I can try to figure out, well, is their volume of distribution different than normal, right? So I can find you know, uh, population averages when I look like on Lexicomp or something. Um, or I can like look at, okay, if I give two different patients the way the same amount, but they have different serum concentrations, well, what's going on? Why is the volume of distribution different here? You can figure these things out. Let's work through that and see if we can figure out 
how we came to this answer. Okay. Okay, so what's our first step here? What do we need to figure out? Well, one, let's rearrange our equation. So if we know that C0 equals dose over VD, how can I uh, rearrange that? Perfect, yeah, VD. So again, instead, I will look at VD equals dose over concentration over C0, right? Again, just basic algebra, right? Just rearranging the other thing here. Okay, so the question is I'm solving for VD. So what am I going to put as my dose? 100 milligrams, perfect. And then uh, for my concentration zero, what am I going to put? 16 milligrams per liter. Okay, so what cancels out here? The milligrams will cancel out, and so I should get what left over. So 100 divided by 16 equals 6.25 liters. Okay, am I done? No. Some people probably put 6.25. In fact, uh, 23 of you did. There's one more step, though. What do you notice the units here? Liters per kilogram. So I still have to factor in how much the patient actually weighs. Because, again, once I do that, once I get a liters per kilogram, I can compare it to multiple patients, right? I can use that number and try to compare it. So what do I do at this point? 6.25 uh, liters divided by 40 kilograms. And that equals 6.25 divided by 40. 0.156. See, I screwed this up too. I should have put a zero here. 0 0.156 liters per kilogram. Right? Is that the right answer? Sure enough, it is. Does that make sense? So again, look at your units. Look what you're trying to answer and make sure it matches up. Okay. Who is my winner? I'm assuming it's going to be Shania Twain. Who's Shania Twain? Fantastic job. You killed it. Uh, Michael Skarn. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, Drizzy Drake. So right in the same area. Are you guys cheating off each other? This is a little convenient. Well, your correct answer for the test is? A. Yep. Any questions I can answer for you before you go? All right. Have a good rest of your day.